All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for attending today's webinar on employment law updates in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and Illinois. Uh, over the past year or so, it's been a, a whirlwind and in all four of these jurisdictions, there's been a lot of new laws that have either been passed or came into effect. Uh, and we are going to go over those today, give you the nuts and bolts of all the updates uh, that you need to know and, and some steps that you need to take to comply with all of those new laws. And we're also going to give you a glimpse of uh, what is to come in 2021. Um, some states are, are a little more proactive than others in, in that regard so far this, this uh, legislative session. Um, so we'll be going over some of those as well. Uh, the voice that you hear right now, my name's Dan Deacon, and I am an associate here in the DC office uh, at Con Maciel Carey. I have been with the firm for about six years now. Uh, I work in both the employment group, uh, the labor and employment group, and the OSHA workplace safety practice group. Uh, so in my role, I, I represent employers uh, in inspections, safety and health inspections conducted by federal and state OSHA and advise and counsel employers on uh, safety and health complaints uh, and defending in OSHA related litigation. Um, on the employment law side, uh, I do pretty much everything under the sun, representing and advising employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, including wage and hour disputes, claims of discrimination uh, in both federal and state courts. Uh, and then I regularly review and revise employee handbooks uh, and workplace uh, policies and procedures. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Ashley Mitchell, and I'll let her introduce herself and then we'll get started with uh, the, the bulk of the presentation here. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone. As Dan said, my name is Ashley Mitchell. I am an associate based in the Chicago office. I work in both the OSHA and labor and employment practice groups uh, with Con Maciel. Um, I've been with the firm for about six months now, but I'm not new to the practice of law. Prior to joining CMC, I was at a plaintiff uh, labor employment shop also in Chicago. And so I've had the pleasure of seeing both sides, of sitting on both sides of the mediation table, of drafting demand letters, responding to demand letters, of drafting complaints and responding to complaints. And I am looking forward to speaking to you all about Illinois law updates today. Great, thanks Ashley. And we'll get started first with the Maryland employment law updates. Um, and if you've been, or if you are an employer, that is located in the DMV area. Uh, Maryland, Virginia, and DC all had a number of, of new laws that went into effect last year and a couple uh, upcoming this year. So this is gonna be a substantial part of, of the presentation. Um, and of course you have a copy of the slides already. Um, so please feel free to follow along, take notes. And if you have any questions now, again, ask them in the chat function or you can follow up with with us later. So first, starting out with Maryland's Mini Warn Act. Uh, Senate Bill 70, uh, 780 was passed last year. Uh, the bill went into effect on October 1st, 2020. And what that did was it revised the Maryland Economic Stabilization Act's requirements for employers to comply with when conducting significant layoffs. Um, specifically, the law changes Maryland employer obligations with respect to notification uh, requirements and, and reporting during workforce layoffs, what, what's termed in the statute as reduction in operations. And we're going to talk a little bit more specifically what that means. But the act itself applies to employers with 50 or more employees, uh, and those covered employers need to provide 60 days of notice to affected employees, union representatives, and several state officials, including the Maryland Department of Labor's dislocated worker unit. Uh, as well as elected officials representing that jurisdiction where the employer is located. Again, and that, that notification and that report needs to be made prior, 60 days prior to the start of any reduction in operations. Uh, the scope is significantly broader than the Federal WARN Act, which many of you may be aware of. Uh, that only applies to employers with 100 or more employees, and the notice requirements are only triggered uh, for a reduction in operations of at least 33% uh, or at least 50 employees. Uh, so the scope of the Maryland Mini Warn Act is significantly broader and something that Maryland employers need 
take a particular note of, uh, especially because the penalties are even greater than those um, in the Federal Warrant Act. The civil penalties for noncompliance can be up to $10,000 per day. And again, this is enforced by the Maryland uh, Secretary of Labor, the Department of Labor. So what is a reduction in operation? That's specifically defined in the act as the relocation of a part of an employer's operation from one workplace to another existing or proposed site, or the shutting down of a workplace or a portion of the operations of a workplace that reduces the number of employees by at least 25% or 15 employees, whichever is greater over any three month period. So remember I mentioned the Federal Warren Act was 33% uh, or at least um, 50 employees and the scope here significantly broader. We're only talking about 25% of employees or 15, uh, whichever is greater over that three month period. So what do you need to do to comply with those notice requirements? Well, the notice that you're gonna be providing to the representatives, affected employees, the state officials, the Maryland Department of Labor, uh, here's what needs to be included. The name and address of the workplace, the name, phone number, and email address of a supervisory employee who will serve as the employer's point of contact, statement that explains whether the reduction in operations is expected to be permanent or temporary, and whether the workplace is expected to shut down, as well as the expected date of the reduction in operations. Um, so if you are a covered employee in, in uh, or a covered employer in Maryland and you are not aware of, of this new legislation that uh, went into effect just a little over five months ago, um, this is something that you, you definitely want to be aware of and take note of um, given everything that's going, gone on over the past year with COVID and, and some of the significant reduction in operations uh, across the country. Um, if this is something that has happened to you or is, is happening uh, now or in the near future, uh, certainly take note of this. All right, and there were uh, a number of different um, updates as well. And just taking a step back, the Maryland uh, laws that went into effect in 2020 and that were passed in 2020, um, were passed largely without Governor Hogan's signature. Um, there were a number of different laws that went into effect, um, including a host of labor and employment laws without his signature. Uh, and those were all related to human rights and discrimination, equal pay, the, the mini Warren Act that we just talked about and, and workplace safety and health. So now we're moving on to the discrimination law updates. Um, and we're talking about House Bill 1444 and Senate Bill 531. Again, that went into effect on October 1st, 2020. And what that does is it expands the definition of race uh, under a host of different uh, anti-discrimination laws in Maryland to include traits associated with race, including hair texture, Afro hairstyles, and protective hairstyles, such as twists, braids, uh, and, and locks. Um, so this is a technical update, expanding the definition of, of race, uh, and something that you want to consider in updating your policies and procedures, your employee handbook, just make sure that this is addressed. Alongside of that, you want to update your training on workplace discrimination and harassment, make sure this is covered, and make sure that supervisors are, and management are well aware of this change. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about, uh, a, little bit about a, a wage uh, issue, and this was passed uh, under House Bill 123, uh, again, effective October 1st, 2020, uh, part of that sweeping legislation that went into effect without Governor Hogan's signature. Um, what this does, it requires employers to provide uh, to job applicants upon request the wage range for uh, the position that they are applying for. Uh, the bill also prohibits um, employers from asking and or relying on the wage history of an applicant in considering them for employment. Uh, so there is some carve outs in that law after the employee, uh, the applicant, I should say, has received an initial offer of employment. Uh, and that offer includes specific compensation. Uh, the employer can rely on wage history voluntarily provided by the applicant to support a wage offer higher than the initial wage offer, not lower. 
uh, and you can seek to confirm the wage history voluntarily provided by the applicant to support that wage offer higher than the initial offer uh, that you provided. Um, so really what we're talking about here is during interviews, you as an employer shouldn't be asking period about an applicant's uh, prior wage history. If that's something that they offer to you voluntarily, um, that is okay. Uh, but you shouldn't be using that information to offer them uh, something significantly lower than, than what uh, would normally be provided. Um, and, you know, as the, the law itself states, you can only rely on that wage history voluntarily provided to support a wage offer higher than the initial wage offer uh, that, that you are providing. Facial rec recognition technology uh, that is banned during job interviews, and this is kind of a nuance, uh, new wave of legislation that's, that's going on throughout the country, uh, Maryland being one of them. Uh, and this was passed under House Bill uh, 1202, again, effective October 1st, 2020. And what this law does is it prohibits employers from using certain facial recognition services during employment interviews, unless that applicant provides consent in advance. So I'm not really sure how many of you are using this technology. It's probably very few um, as it's something that is relatively new. But if you are, uh, certainly be aware of this new legislation because it does have um, some certain specific requirements um, and that being that you need a written waiver uh, in order to use this and that's prior to the interview. So what does that waiver include? Well, it needs to have the applicant's name, the date of the interview, uh, a specific uh, language in that uh, waiver that the applicant consents to the use of facial recognition technology, uh, and a statement that the applicant has read the waiver and consents to it. So make sure that you keep that record um, in an employee's file um, or an applicant's uh, application file uh, and, and make sure that you're maintaining that record uh, properly. So what is facial recognition services? A lot of you may be saying, well, I don't even know what this is. How does it apply to me? Well, it's basically technology that uses a facial template, uh, a machine interpretable pattern of facial features that extracted from one or more images of an individual. And a lot of employers use this um, to uh, uh, evaluate post uh, interviews, reactions, uh, um, body language, et cetera. Um, it's not super common, but there is concern that it could be used in a discriminatory manner, uh, hence why this facial recognition technology is banned during job interviews now, unless you have prior written consent and a waiver from that employee. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about OSHA. Um, Maryland OSHA uh, is considering a heat stress standard. Actually, I should say they're more than considering that. Uh, House Bill 722 and Senate Bill 434, that was passed and went into effect um, again October 1st, 2020. And what that does is it requires the Commissioner of Labor and Industry in Maryland to develop and adopt regulations on or before October 1st, 2022, that are intended to protect employees from heat-related illnesses in the workplace, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, so we do have quite a bit of time until these regulations are supposed to be rolled out, um, but it does take time. The regulatory process is long, um, and so this is something that is certainly on their radar. It's been directed to be addressed by the legislature, um, so don't be surprised if this is rolled out sooner rather than later. Given everything that's going on with COVID right now, however, um, I'm sure they do have their hands busy, and this part of the rulemaking is, is probably something that has taken a little bit of a backseat um, over the past past year. Um, so it's to be determined when this will be rolled out. It's worth noting that Fed OSHA does not have a heat illness standard. So Maryland's gonna be soon one of the few state plan states to regulate heat stress uh, throughout the country. <clears throat> That's joining just a few states, California, Minnesota, and Washington. Um, but there is significant guidance out there not only from these three states that already have a heat stress standard, but also Fed OSHA does have guidance. Um, so you as an employer in Maryland can start to begin evaluating the workplace uh, under that current Fed OSHA guidance or look to other state plan states to ensure you're, you're prepared for those new regulations. 
you can receive uh, what's called a general duty clause citation uh, for heat stress related illnesses if that hazard is not addressed properly uh, in your workplace. Um, and fines, of course, can range anywhere from 7,000 up to 70,000 um, or more. So that, that's something that obviously a lot of employers are already well aware of and, and considering. Um, but be on the lookout for specific regulations applicable to Maryland employers coming soon. Now, the last one here in Maryland, we're just going to cover something that is specific to Montgomery County employers. Uh, and this was Bill 1219, became effective at the start of the, this new year, January 1st, 2021. And what that does, it requires certain employers to provide a minimum work week of at least 30 hours for building maintenance workers. So that's including janitors, building cleaners, security officers, concierge uh, personnel, door persons, handy persons, or building superintendents who perform janitorial services. So, so who does this, or who does this apply to? What what type of employers are covered under this bill? Well, it applies to employers operating specifically in Montgomery County that employ just one or more persons as a building maintenance worker in any office building or contiguous group of office buildings under common ownership or management that occupies a total of 350,000 square feet or more in, in Montgomery County. And those buildings also have an occupancy rate of 50% or more. So this is pretty technical language, large space, but all you need is one employee, one or more employees serving as building, building maintenance folks uh, in those office buildings and you are, you are covered. Uh, maintenance workers, however, do not include managerial workers, uh, or those employees that work in executive, administrative, or professional capacities, uh, or employees who make more than $30.50 per hour, um, or those who only work on Saturdays or Sundays in temporary placements. So there is a little bit of a carve out as well under, under the bill here. Uh, employers are permitted to reserve 30% of the total hours scheduled for all maintenance work for part-time workers with a minimum shift of four hours per day and 20 hours per week per part-time employer or part-time uh, worker or employee. So this bill is quite technical. Uh, the message here, if you do have building maintenance workers in one of these buildings in Montgomery County, 350 square feet or more um, that has an occupancy rate of 50% or more, uh, we wanted to take a close look at the specific requirements, uh, what those folks are being paid per hour, what their uh, total hours scheduled for are throughout the week, um, and whether they fall within any of these carve outs. Um, but you want to make sure that they're getting, if they are a covered employee, uh, that they're getting at least 30 hours of work per week. Okay, now we're moving on to the Virginia side of things. Um, and like Maryland, there was a host of new laws that, that went into effect in Virginia throughout the past year. Um, apologize, having problems moving the slide here. So first we're going to start with the private right of action for wage claims. And this was passed through Senate Bill 838, went into effect July 1st, 2020. And what that does is it provides a new private right of action for Virginia employees to sue in state court for unpaid wages. Uh, this provision also um, includes language under which a general contractor and subcontractor can be jointly and severally liable to pay wages to a subcontractor's employee, and that's limited to construction contracts only. So if you are a construction contractor, uh, specifically a general contractor, this is something that you want to pay particularly close attention to and making sure that those subcontractors are properly paying their, their employees um, because you can be jointly and severally liable uh, for any wage related claims against that subcontractor. Now there are indemnification uh, provisions in, in the bill, in the law. Uh, so subcontractors are responsible for indemnifying a general contractor. Uh, for any damages that they incur, including attorney's fees. Uh, but you don't want to go through that headache if you don't have to, right? So make sure that you're paying particularly close attention to the, the wages being paid to subcontractor employees uh, and that they are adequately following the law uh, and 
make sure that they're aware of this law. Uh, and if, to the extent that you need to revise any of your construction contracts to incorporate language from this bill into those contracts, making sure that there is an indemnification clause specifically laid out, that's something that you want to consider too. Uh, the prevailing plaintiffs in a wage claim can recover unpaid wages, liquidated damages, and attorney's fees. Uh, and there's also the potential to recover treble damages, or triple damages if the employer is found to have knowingly failed to pay proper wages. So this again goes back to wage issues. This next slide here, and this is private rights of action for misclassified employees. Under House Bill 984 and Senate Bill 894, effective July 1st, 2020, that provides individuals who believe they're misclassified as independent contractors the right to sue for damages. Um, so that includes wages, salary, benefits, and expenses. Um, so the individual who perform services, uh, work for the employer, is presumed to be an employee unless he or she meets the IRS gu guidelines for independent contractors. Um, so the IRS guidelines have been around for quite some time, and a lot of you on the presentation today are, are probably aware of this. Um, but this is a significant law passed in Virginia because it gives those employees the right to sue in state court. Um, and of course, if we're talking about wage issues or generally any type of employment issues, um, we, we find it much more beneficial to be in federal court. There's typically federal claims tied to a lot of these wage claims. Um, and it's certainly more favorable for you as an employer generally to be in federal court. Um, so the risk here is employees filing wage claims um, or these misclassification claims solely in state court uh, and you run the risk of, of uh, litigating before a state court judge who may not be as familiar with, with the wage issues that are typically brought up in the employment context. Um, associated with these misclassification issues, there were a couple other uh, laws that were passed uh, related to misclassification. Um, so we'll just kind of uh, go through those really quickly. They're not on the screen here, um, but things that you should be aware of. So there was another bill, House Bill 1199, uh, that was passed prohibiting retaliation against a person for reporting uh, misclassification. Uh, that's enforced by the Commissioner of Labor and Industry, and they can institute uh, legal proceedings on behalf of the employee uh, seeking remedies of reinstatement, uh, back wages, um, and you can also be liable for a civil penalty. House Bill 1407 authorizes the Department of Taxation to conduct investigations into suspected uh, worker misclassification. So that went into effect January 1st, 2021. Uh, and then finally, House Bill 1646 provides uh, that the Board of Contractors can require a, a contractor to classify workers appropriately as independent uh, contractors or employees. So it gives the board a little more oversight uh, and the ability to sanction employers or contractors who are found to have misclassified workers intentionally. Um, so, so in light of these new laws, the four new laws related to uh, employees, contractors, independent contractors, you definitely want to take a look at your employee relationships, independent contractor relationships uh, as soon as possible to ensure that everyone is properly classified. Non-compete agreements prohibited for low-wage workers. Uh, so this bill, House Bill uh, 330, uh, was passed effective July 1st, 2020. And what that does is prohibits non-competes for what is defined as low-wage workers uh, as a condition of employment. And those low-wage workers are individuals who earn less than the average wage in the Commonwealth, currently uh, $1,125 a week or $58,500 per year. The law does not apply to employees whose earnings are derived um, in whole or in part from sales commissions, incentives, or bonuses. So that is the one carve out. Uh, what the law does is it restricts both agreements that restrict an employee's ability to compete with the former employer after termination and agreements that restrict an employee from providing services to the employer's customers if the employee does not initiate contact with or solicit the customer or client. Um, so this is an example of a law that is being passed in many states throughout the country 
Um, and we're going to see in DC as well a similar law banning the use of non compete agreements uh, was also passed just this past year. Um, so this kind of comes as, as no surprise. Uh, and a lot of you have, have probably already been familiar with with these laws. Um, especially if you're a national employer and in other jurisdictions that have these types of non compete agreement prohibitions. Um, there is a, a two year statute of limitation for employees to sue former employers for a violation of these uh, of this law. Uh, and the potential civil penalties that are enforced by the Virginia Employment Commission uh, are significant. Uh, they can be up to $10,000 per instance. Um, the one thing, if you already have existing non-compete agreements uh, that would be prohibited by this law, um, the law actually only applies to agreements entered into on or after July 1st, 2020. Uh, so this means any non-competes signed or entered into before that date wouldn't run afoul of the new law, but of course they still would be deemed likely unenforceable under the ex existing limitation. Um, so you may not be subject to uh, the civil penalties or any type of enforcement necessarily, but you could, uh, you know, if, if you try to enforce that non-compete, it, it likely would be deemed unenforceable by a court. So we also have a few discrimination law updates in Virginia. Um, starting first with House Bill 1514, that expands the prohibition on race discrimination to include discrimination based on traits historically associated with race. So like uh, the Maryland law that was also recently passed, this includes hair texture, hair type, and protective hairstyles such as braids, locks, and twists. Uh, so again, if you haven't updated your uh, employee handbook to include uh, and, and carve out this specific language, uh, certainly do so, as well as update your training and, and make sure that employees and management alike are aware of this change in Virginia's discrimination laws. Moving on to House Bill 827 and Senate Bill 712, uh, that amended the Virginia Human Rights Act to require a covered employer to provide reasonable accommodation for the known limitations of an employee related to pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, unless such an employee uh, accommodation would impose an undue hardship on the employer. Um, so this is a, a carve out into the Virginia Human Rights Act, specifically rated, uh, related to pregnancy related accommodations and discrimination, um, something that a lot of employers are already well aware of and ha have incorporated it into their existing policies. Um, but to the extent that you haven't, uh, it's, it's prudent to do so now. Um, there's also uh, a pregnancy rights poster that needs to be posted or should have been posted in the workplace by October 29th, 2020. Uh, and I should say that House Bill 827 requires you to update your handbook um, to include that language about uh, reasonable accommodations or pregnancy related uh, condition limitations. Senate Bill 868, continuing on with some more discrimination law updates in Virginia. This broadens Virginia's existing discrimination laws by expanding the scope of employers covered under the law. Uh, and this is pretty significant for, for basically all employers in Virginia. Um, the law previously prohibited only unlawful discharge claims based on a protected category um, to employers with between five and 15 employees. Um, and unlawful discharge based on age discrimination for employers with uh, five to 19 employees. Uh, so now under this new change, unlawful discharge claims can now be brought against all employers with more than five employees and claims uh, that do not involve discharge may be brought against employers with 15 or more employees. Um, so there is some significant more uh, uh, coverage under the law, the state law, right? And again, what this allows employees to do is bring that claim specifically in just state court if they want to. Um, what Senate Bill 868 also did in addition to expanding the scope of employers covered under uh, the discrimination laws, it also added new employee protections um, by adding sexual orientation and gender identity to the list of protected categories. 
in the Virginia Human Rights Act, and that's uh, the first Southern state to officially do so. Virginia's general whistleblower claim. Um, this law here is, it generally mirrors uh, the typical whistleblower laws that you see um, in both the federal context and other states. Uh, so this shouldn't be anything that is too surprising or uh, difficult for employers to comply with, but now it is officially on the books in Virginia. House Bill 798 created basically a general whistleblower protection law that allows employees, again, to sue specifically in state court. Uh, the statute protects employees who, in good faith, report a violation or suspected violation of any federal or state law or regulation to the employer or any governmental involved governmental body or law enforcement official, uh, employees who requested a government uh, body or law enforcement official to participate in an investigation, hearing, or inquiry, the employee refuses to engage in a criminal act, refuses an employer's order to perform an act that the employee believes uh, would violate the law or a specific federal or state regulation, uh, and also it protects employees providing information to or testifying before any governmental body or law enforcement official. So basically a broader anti-retaliation policy giving employees the right to sue in state court. And again, the uh, statute of limitations under this provision is one year. So an employee that feels they've uh, been retaliated against um, has one year from the date of that retaliation to initiate a claim against the employer. As far as remedies go under the, the law here, the court can order uh, an employer um, uh, to restrain the continued violation. Uh, in other words, issue an injunctive order. Uh, they can order reinstatement of the employee uh, to an equivalent position or the same position before the retaliatory act. Uh, and they can also seek compensation, uh, lost wages, benefits, or other remuneration um, that, that an employee would have been entitled to had they stayed employed or in the position that they had. Now we're going to move on to a little bit about Vosh's COVID-19 rule. Um, and for those employers in Virginia, I'm sure you are well aware of this since it has been around for quite some time now. Vosh, uh, Virginia Occupational Safety and Health Administration, they were the first uh, state plan to pass a standard specifically regulating COVID-19. And that occurred <coughs> excuse me, back on July 15th, 2020. Uh, and the permanent standard, uh, I should back up for a second, the emergency temporary standard was only in effect for six months, hence why they had to uh, initiate the rulemaking to pass a permanent standard. And that was passed in early January and went into effect on January 26, 2021. Again, the first state to pass a permanent COVID-19 rule as well. Uh, and since then, we've, we've seen a few others, California being one of them. There's also a few specific state legislation, uh, legislate, legislative acts that have implemented COVID-19 laws. Um, but Virginia was the first one uh, to really step up and, and regulate COVID-19 in the workplace. So we're not going to go into a ton of detail on the rule itself. We've done presentations uh, that last an hour and a half on, on the rules specific provisions. Um, and you can check those out on, on our YouTube uh, page and our YouTube channel if you want some additional information on, on the nuances of the rule. But the basic provisions are what you see on the screen here. Employers are required to perform uh, hazard assessments and they're specific uh, job categories uh, based on, on the tasks. So there's low level risk, medium level risks, high level, <coughs> and very high. Those very high and high uh, exposure level workplaces are typically the healthcare settings. And a lot of employers traditionally fall under that medium category. And if you're pr purely an office setting and there's limited interaction between employees, you're in the low risk category. Um, and the administrative and engineering controls and safe work practices, uh, those there's certain administrative engineering and controls and safe work practices applicable to all employers. And then there's certain specific controls and practices applicable 
uh, to employers depending on your risk category. Uh, but some of those uh, traditional ones that uh, you see in uh, applicable to all employees include the social distancing elements, return to work criteria. Uh, there's some nuances with what type of air ventilation is required. That's typically the high and uh, very high uh, risk category workplaces. Uh, certain PPE requirements, depending again on the, the risk category, um, and general cleaning and disinfecting protocols. There's also notification requirements uh, that you as an employer have to make to employees, subcontractors, building owners, to VOSH and the Virginia Department of Health in the event that there is a positive case in your workplace. Um, and then there's, of course, the written response plan, uh, COVID-19 response plan requirements, and that details exactly what you need in your written plan. And there's also templates available uh, on VOSH's website. And of course, you need to train all employees on, on the protocols and the written plan that you've put together. Uh, so we've put together several countless plans over the past year, uh, several um, related specifically to Virginia. So if you are an employer that uh, does in Virginia that does not have one of these yet, please feel free to reach out um, and we can help you get that in place as soon as possible. VOSH is actively enforcing these uh, provisions and we've seen just in the past, I'd say three, four months, a significant uptick in enforcement, especially as it relates to uh, COVID-19. Seems now that OSHA uh, and VOSH, I guess we're talking specifically about Virginia, they've kind of settled in and figured out, okay, here's what we need to do to regulate the workplace. They've issued the rules and now enforcement is really starting to pick up. So be, be on the lookout for that. And finally, we're going to end here on the Virginia side with the um, couple slides on, on wages again um, and salary issues. So the minimum wage is increasing. Senate Bill 7 increased the minimum wage for Virginia employees from $7.25 to $9.50. Um, and that goes into effect May 1st, 2021. And it's going to be increasing each year until it reaches $15 per hour. So that's that strive for $15. Uh, that's kind of going throughout uh, all, most states throughout the country. Um, we're seeing an uptick in, in legislation related to that, that drive for 15. Um, the wage, minimum wage is again going to increase on January 1st, 2022 to $11 per hour. And again, January 1st, 2023 to $12 an hour. And then subsequently in 2024 and beyond, the General Assembly in Virginia is gonna to have to reenact or essentially confirm by legislation any additional increases to the minimum wage. But for purposes of this year, we know in the next two or three years, we know that we do have uh, lockstep increases. All right, inquiries into salary history are prohibited. Uh, House Bill 416 prohibits employers from asking about salary history of applicants. So we've gone over this in the Maryland context. Similarly, it's, it's essentially the same thing here in Virginia. Uh, the in Virginia Employment Commission can enforce the bill and assess fines up to $100 per violation. Um, the one caveat here, it has passed the House uh, and it was before the Senate in 2020, uh, but they did not have sufficient time to address it. So it's pushed into this legislative session. Um, and that is something that is likely going to be passed this year. Um, so to the extent that you want to be proactive and start making those changes, if it's typical practice for you to ask employees about their salary history, which we traditionally advise against anyway, as a general practice, um, you certainly should start uh, amending those, those policies now. All right, now we're going to get into the DC law updates. And here it's a little bit lighter than the Maryland and Virginia uh, law updates. But again, there's, there's quite a few more so related to COVID-19 than you see in Virginia and, and Maryland. And those are related particularly to leave laws. So the COVID-19 paid leave that amended, uh, this was a, a law uh, amending the accrued sick and safe leave act. Uh, and what it did is it provided paid leave to covered employees who work in the District of Columbia for employers that have between 50 and 499 employees. Note the caveat there, that's not a healthcare provider. Um, 
To be a covered employee, you need to be employed for at least 15 days to be eligible for paid leave. Uh, and those in, eligible employees are entitled to fully paid leave for two weeks, maximum of 80 hours, can be prorated for part-time part -time employees um, for the same COVID-related re reasons that were listed in the former FSCRA. Um, and we don't need to go through the specifics of, of what those covered uh, reasons are, um, but it's generally right, you're subject to a quarantine order, uh, you're advised by a healthcare provider to stay at home and self-quarantine. You're caring for an individual subject to one of uh, what what I just said, a self-quarantine order or uh, uh, a healthcare providing you uh, a notice to stay home. Uh, if you're caring for a child whose school uh, or place of care is closed or you're experiencing some other uh, condition uh, as defined or specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So like the FFCRA, which is now expired, this is only a one-time benefit. So employees who already used their two weeks of paid leave are not entitled to again if another um, COVID-related reason comes up. So it's a one-time benefit, two weeks, that's it. Alongside of that, there's the unpaid leave portion. And this was an amendment to the DC Family and Medical Leave Act. So in addition to the two weeks, 80 hours of paid leave that we just talked about, DC City Council adopted an unpaid leave benefit uh, providing employees 16 weeks separate and apart from the 16 weeks of family leave uh, and, and medical leave provided under the existing DCFMLA. Uh, what's different from the paid leave portion is the coverage, right? This applies to all employers in DC. Uh, and it is available when a covered employee who is an employee who's worked for 30 days uh, as opposed to the 15 under the, the paid leave law. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, that's when they're unable to work for one of the following reasons that you see on the screen here. And that's a recommendation from a healthcare provider that the employee isolate or quarantine, uh, a need to care for a family member or household who's under a government or healthcare provider's order to quarantine, uh, or the need to care for a child whose school or place of care is closed um, uh, or it's unavailable to the employee. Uh, so the criteria uh, to meet uh, th this leave and to be able to be eligible for this leave is a little narrower than those uh, provided under the FFCRA and the DC paid leave provisions. Um, but again, the, the coverage does apply to all employers. In DC. And that's 16 weeks in addition to 16 provided for uh, under the existing DC FMLA. Um, and the one caveat here uh, is both the paid and unpaid leave provisions are in effect for the duration of Mayor Bowser's COVID-19 public health emergency. Uh, and that is extended currently, it says on the screen here, March 31st, 2021, but that was just recently extended uh, to May 20th, 2021. Um, so that is in effect for a couple more months, two more months. Um, and there is a, a sunset provision on there as well. It's no later than May 22nd, 2021. Uh, so this unpaid leave provision should be expiring uh, within just shy of two months. Another COVID related uh, law that was passed in DC is the Reinstatement of Displaced Workers uh, Act, uh, specifically Displaced Workers Right to Reinstatement and Retention Amendment Act. Uh, and that went into effect on February 1st, 2021 requires certain DC employers to reinstate workers whose jobs were eliminated during the pandemic. Uh, so specifically, what we're talking about here is owners of restaurants, taverns, roof pubs, nightclubs, uh, clubs, entertainment venues, and retail establishments that employed 50 or more employees as of March 1st, 2020, as well as hotels that employed 50 or more employees as of December 1st, 2019. So contractors as well, applies to contractors that employ 25 or more employees uh, and have hired individuals to work as food service workers in a hotel, restaurant, cafeteria, apartment building, hospital, institution, or similar establishment, janitorial or building maintenance staff in an office building or similar establishment, non-professional employees to perform healthcare or related services in a hospital, nursing care facility, or similar establishment, or individuals who provide security services and office building or institution. Um, the offer of reinstatement 
here. This applies to all employees let go between December 1st, 2019 at a covered hotel, as well as uh, employees let go uh, after March 1st, 2020 uh, for all those other covered employees we, we talked about, right? So restaurants, club, uh, nightclubs, et cetera. Um, and and the, the end date in this legislation is the last day of the public health emergency. Uh, again, this has been extended just recently to May 20th, 2021. Um, so we're talking uh, about a little over um, a year or for both uh, covered hotels and, and other employers. Um, there is some carve outs here. Uh, the, offers do not, the offers of reinstatement do not need to be made to salaried exempt employees or employees who receive sever severance payments in connection with their discharge. Uh, or employees that were terminated for cause, right? Uh, the employer needs to make that offer in writing uh, and allowing a deadline of no less than three calendar days to accept or to decline that offer of reinstatement. The TIP Wage Workers Fairness Clarification Amendment Act of 2020, this is not something that is new uh, to DC employers. However, there was um, a lag in uh, passing a budget to enforce and uh, kind of come up to speed with the requirements of the, the law. Uh, that was fully funded on December 3rd, 2020. So now the mandatory sexual harassment training is fully enforceable. The universal notice and posting requirements uh, are in effect and you've likely been complying with those posting and notice requirements uh, for well over a year now anyway. And the one thing to keep an eye out for is the development of a comprehensive website by Mayor Bowser outlining employees' rights uh, and a corresponding notice poster. And that's uh, an internal deadline set of April 2nd, 2021 for them to get that out and rolled out on their new website. DC ban on non-competes. And we're seeing this, this wave of a ban on non-competes for low-wage workers. This is something that is fairly new to DC as well, just passed on January 11th, 2021. Uh, Mayor Bowser signed the Ban on Non-Compete Agreements Amendment Act of 2020, and it effectively bans employers' use of non-compete agreements against employees in the District of Columbia. Um, so this is a little broader than the one that we were talking about um, in the other jurisdictions. The act prohibits employers from having employees sign any non-compete agreements or implementing any policies that prevent employees from being employed by another person or employer, performing work or providing services for pay for another person or operating the employee's own business. Uh, there are certain exclusions, extremely narrow. Um, the, the one notable one is medical specialists that make at least $250,000 a year. Um, and, and there's some other minor nuanced ones like a babysitter. Um, but the, the exclusions are, are extremely narrow under this law. So certainly if you're uh, an employer in DC that uses non-compete agreements, uh, we're gonna take a close look at this law and make sure that um, uh, you know, we're re revisiting those and taking a second look at whether they are enforceable at all. Uh, the law does not prohibit the use of non-solicitation and confidentiality agreements, however. So to the extent that you combine all three of those agreements, typically with employees or prospective employees, um, you can still use non-solicitation and confidentiality agreements going forward. Uh, quickly, we're gonna go over the, the minimum wage increase and then we'll turn it over to Ashley to go over Illinois. Um, this is the last slide that I have for you all. Uh, there's gonna be a minimum wage increase beginning on July 1st, 2021 in DC. Uh, it's going to increase from $15 per hour to $15.20 per hour for all workers, regardless of the size. Uh, and the base minimum wage for tipped employees will increase from $5 per hour to $5.05. Um, so be prepared to make those changes uh, coming up in four months or so. And with that, I will turn it over to Ashley and she can go through Illinois um, and we'll do our best to get to the chat function here and answer any additional questions that you have at the end. Thanks, Dan. So as Dan said, we're now going to turn to the Illinois employment, employment law updates, the majority of which would have taken place last year. Um, and we're doing some refreshers and um, some reminders about 
how those changes that took effect last year affect employers reporting requirements this year. Um, so first, we'll take a look at the Illinois minimum wage increase on the next slide. Um, and as you can see here, as of January 1st, 2021, the minimum wage in Illinois is now $11 per hour for workers um, 18 years of age and older. Um, an employer where gratuities are paid to their employees uh, may pay 60% of the minimum wage to its employees. And so um, that would bring the tipped minimum wage to $6.60. Um, employers may apply for licenses to pay sub-minimum uh, wage rates to learners and certain workers with physical and mental limitations. And then also this um, minimum wage increase notes that overtime must be paid after 40 hours of work per week and that overtime pay is one and a half times the regular rate of pay. Um, it should be noted that this increase is a part of a stair step scheduled increase and employers can expect another increase next year, January 1 of 2022. Um, next, we're going to look at the Human Rights Act amendment. Um, and so there was an amendment to the Illinois Human Rights Act, which expanded the definition of employer um, originally, it was an employer with at least 15 employees, and now, thanks to this amendment, an employer under the Illinois Human Rights Act is any employer who does business in the state of Illinois and has one or more employees. Uh, by way of reminder, this act forbids discrimination in employment, real estate, transactions, education, public accommodations, and access to financial credit, and it forbids discrimination on the basis of um, the following protected categories, bear with me, there are quite a few here, including sex, age, race, color, religion, arrest record, conviction record, marital status, familial status, disability, citizenship, national origin, ancestry, unfavorable military discharge, military status, retaliation, sexual harassment, sexual orientation, pregnancy and accommodations related to pregnancy and employment, and in order of protection status. The amendment to the Illinois Human Rights Act, as we can see on the next slide, also put in place mandatory harassment training. And so employers are encouraged to retrain new employees, regardless of whether or not that employee received the required training at a prior place of employment. And the reason being is, employers must independently retain their own records to show that all employees in their workplace have received the required sexual harassment prevention training. Um, if it is the case that an employer is hiring a new employee, they may in fact ask that employee to provide the documentation that they completed the training elsewhere. But it's imperative that um, the employer knows that they are responsible for ensuring that the training that that new employee received elsewhere is compliant with the training as outlined in the Illinois Human Rights Act. And so what's suggested is if the employer is unable to obtain the proper documentation that the employer just go ahead um, and retrain that employee. Um, under the mandatory harassment trainings, employers may develop their own sexual harassment prevention training program provided that it meets or exceeds the minimum training standards as outlined in the legislation. Um, and those standards include an explanation of sexual harassment consistent with the Illinois Human Rights Act, examples of conduct that constitute unlawful sexual harassment, a summary of relevant federal and state statutory provisions concerning sexual harassment, including the remedies that are available to the victims of sexual harassment, and a summary of responsibilities of you, the employer, and the prevention, investigation, and corrective measures of sexual harassment. Now, of course, while employers may um, come up with their own training, the Illinois Human Rights Commission has also published a training that is available on their website. Um, and as we'll see, well, it's again, I want to reiterate that it's imperative that employers keep a record of all required training because such records must be made available for inspection upon request from the Illinois Department of Human Rights. Now, these records may be a certificate 
or a signed employee acknowledgement or a course sign in worksheet. Um, the records may be kept in paper or electronic format. It's just imperative that if and when the IDHR um, requests, the employer is able to produce those. And as we can see on the next slide, there are additional requirements for uh, hospitality employers. So every restaurant and bar is required to provide employees with supplemental sexual harassment prevention training that complies with these Illinois Human Rights Amendments, the amendments to the Illinois Human Rights Act. So this is in addition to the sexual harassment prevention training that we just discussed. And so the minimum supplemental training standards include um, specific conduct, activities, or videos related to the restaurant and bar industry, um, an explanation of manager liability and responsibility under the law, and then last, English and Spanish language options. So in addition to these supplemental training requirements, as you can see on the slide, hospitality and employers must also provide certain employees with personal safety and notification devices, expressly inform employees about protections against sexual harassment and discrimination, and take measures to separate um, employees from offending guests. Next, we will turn to the um, Workplace Transparency Act, or the WTA for short which applies to employers, a term as defined in the Illinois Human Rights Act, meaning it applies to all employers with one or more employees. And the WTA affects arbitration agreements, separation and settlement agreements, um, as well as provides um, a duty to employers for information requests with the IDHR. And so as we can see here under the WTA, um, can you go back one slide? Forward one, please. Thank you. So as we can see here under the WTA, employment agreements cannot impose non-negotiable unilateral conditions, which are conditions that prospective or current employees must accept to obtain or keep their jobs. Um, and the goal of this is to prevent, and what we're saying is these uh, unilateral conditions cannot prevent prospective or current employees from making truthful statements about alleged unlawful discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. It cannot require prospective or current employees to arbitrate claims relating to alleged unlawful discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. And it cannot require those employees to waive or otherwise diminish existing or future claims rights or benefits relating to unlawful discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. Now, these conditions may be allowed if they are part of a mutual agreement between the employer and the employee, and that agreement must be written. It has to reflect actual knowing and bargain for consideration from both parties, and it must acknowledge the employee's right to report a good faith allegation of an unlawful employment practice or criminal conduct to the appropriate government authorities, participate in any appropriate governmental agency's enforcement of discrimination laws, make truthful statements or disclosures required by law, regulation, or legal process, and request or receive confidential legal advice. If the employer, if you as the employer, do not comply with all of these requirements for the mutual agreement, there is a rebuttable presumption that the condition is unilateral. And unilateral conditions under the WTA are void as they are against Illinois public policy and they will be severable from an otherwise valid and enforceable agreement. Um, as we can see on the next slide, the WTA also um, requires some disclosures. The first one was in July of last year and the next reporting deadline will be July 1 of 2021, so July 1 of this year, and those disclosures will be for the year of 2020. And in these disclosures, employers must report the number of adverse judgments and administrative rulings entered against them during the previous year in each of several categories, including those adverse rulings and judgments issued on claims of discrimination or harassment on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, religion, age, disability, military status, sexual orientation or gender identity, or any other basis protected by the Illinois Human Rights Act. 
Employers are also required to report um, whether any equitable relief was ordered. And as you're thinking about this report and where you make it, um, employers may use the IDHR Form 2-108, which is available on the IDHR's website. Next, we'll take a look at the Victims Economic Security and Safety Act, or VESA, as it's called for short, um, which provides that an employee working for an employer with at least one, but not more than 14 employees, shall be entitled to a total of four weeks of leave during any 12-month period. And then um, bumping up to employees working for an employer with at least 15, but not more than 49 employees, they're entitled to a total of eight work weeks of leave during any 12-month period. And then moving on to the next category of employer with at least 50 employees, those employees are entitled to 12, works of leave, 12 work weeks of leave during any 12-month period. And the total number of work weeks to which an employee is entitled shall not decrease during any relevant 12-month period. Um, an employee may take VESA leave for any of the following reasons, including to seek medical attention, for or recovery from physical or psychological injuries caused by domestic or sexual violence to the employee or employee's family or household member, to obtain victim services for the employee or employee's family or household member, to obtain psychological or other counseling for the employee or the employee's family or household member, to participate in safety planning, including temporary or permanent relocation, or other actions to increase the safety of the victim from future domestic or sexual violence, or to seek legal assistance to ensure the health and safety of the victim, including participating in court proceedings related to the violence. It is important to note that this VESA leave may be taken intermittently or on a reduced work schedule. Next, we'll take a look at the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act, which also has amendments. Um, it was effective in January of last year. And just briefly, the um, act allows that anyone over the age of 21 can legally possess, buy, and use marijuana in the state of Illinois. Um, and we'll take a look at what this means for employers. The Cannabis Act, which legalized uh, under Illinois state law, the adult recreational use of cannabis went into effect January 1 of last year. Um, but this act also permits employers to adopt a reasonable zero tolerance or drug-free workplace policy, so long as those policies are applied in a non-discriminatory manner, um, in addition to affirming an employer's right to discipline or terminate an employee for violating an employer's workplace drug policies. So as originally written, the Cannabis Act included explicit exceptions to employer liability for taking employment actions against employees, um, including actions based on the employer's good faith belief, and we will talk more detail about what that good faith belief must be based on, um, that an employee used or possessed cannabis while at work or working, or actions based on an employer's good faith belief that an employee was impaired or under the influence of cannabis while at work or working. Um, there is an amendment. It was signed before the act even took effect in December of 19. So the amendment did go into effect with the act in January 1 of 2020. And the amendment provides for an additional exception to employer liability, stating that no cause of action shall arise against an employer for actions taken pursuant to an employer's reasonable workplace drug policy, including but not limited to subjecting an employer applicant to reasonable drug and alcohol testing, reasonable and non-discriminatory random drug testing, and discipline, termination of employment, or withdrawal of an employment offer due to a, fail a failed drug test. So essentially, the amendment makes clear that employees may continue pre-employment drug testing and, to the extent permissible by the employer's workplace policy, withdraw offers of employment to employees who tested positive for cannabis use, in addition to disciplining or terminating employees pursuant to failed drug tests under an existing zero-tolerance zero, um, 
drug policy. And so the act uh, permitted employers to, as I've stated, maintain reasonable zero tolerance or drug-free workplace programs. Uh, it also allowed employers to prohibit the possession of use in marijuana of the workplace, in the workplace or while on the job, and it identified various objective factors that employers could rely upon. Now, for those employers who don't have policies, uh, the act explains that off-duty use of marijuana is protected. Um, the employer cannot terminate an employee based solely on a positive test and an employer must have evidence of impairment at the time of working in the workplace if they are going to base any employment decisions on the use of cannabis. And as we can see on the next slide, the statute uh, does define that good faith basis that we've talked about, and it reads in relevant part, an employer may consider an employee to be impaired or under the influence of cannabis if the employer has a good faith belief that an employee manifest specific articulable symptoms while working that decrease or lessen the employee's performance of the duties or tasks of the employee's job position, including symptoms of the employee's speech, physical dexterity, agility, coordination, demeanor, irrational or unusual behavior, or negligence or carelessness in operating equipment or machinery disregard for the safety of the employee or others, or involvement in any accident that results in serious damage to equipment or property, disruption of a production or manufacturing process, or carelessness that results in any injury to the employee or other. If an employer elects to discipline an employee on the basis that the employee is under the influence or impaired by cannabis, the employer must afford the employee a reasonable opportunity to contest the basis of the determination. And so here it's just important that as employers are looking at these good faith basis policies, they are being applied in a non-discriminatory manner and equally across the board to all of their employees. And with that being said, and I believe this is my last Illinois employment law update. Yep. So that concludes today's presentation. Um, there are a few resources for uh, those of you that uh, would like to follow along on state law updates, which we're constantly posting on our, our blogs, uh, the employer defense report. We also have a COVID-19 task force, uh, a specific web page with a host of resources uh, to help comply with the new uh, uh, regulations that are anticipated to be coming uh, out of Bedosha, um, the Vosh rule, of course, um, and a host of other uh, COVID-19 related issues. Um, again, if you have not followed our blogs yet, uh, we have the Employer Defense Report covering all the employment law updates that we regularly blog about, as well as the OSHA Defense Report on the workplace safety and health side of things. Uh, and we have uh, our webinar series, one webinar every month. This was our March uh, webinar, the third in our 2021 labor and employment series. The next one's gonna be April 14th, uh, just, uh, discussing withdrawal liability pension matters. Um, we do have a question about the, it was the Maryland wage issues, the wage range being provided to applicants upon request. Uh, the question is, what if an employer asks the applicant or candidate for a copy of their last W-2 during the interview process uh, or after the offer? Uh, it would, under this law, it would be um, advisable not to ask for that W-2 during the interview process or use it in any way to make a decision about whether to offer that employee uh, the position. Um, it would be uh, fine to request that after, I believe. The law only uh, prohibits asking uh, and relying on wage history of an applicant uh, for consideration uh, for employment. So after the applicants receive that initial offer of employment, uh, that includes that specific compensation figure, if they voluntarily provide that information, um, that, is, that is fine. Um, as far as specifically requesting it from them, I'd have to look into that a little further. 
uh, and what and whether that is permissible under the law. I'm not entirely sure, but I can certainly follow up with you after the uh, presentation here. And if I may, I think that question was asked um, in the Maryland context, but I wanted to point out that Illinois also has a no salary history ban. Um, it went into effect a couple years ago, so we didn't cover it today. But um, similarly to the ones Dan discussed, in Illinois, um, employers are not permitted to ask anything about a prospective employee's wages during the um, application process. So perhaps if that W-2 was asked about, like Dan said, after the initial offer was made and then after um, the salary determination was made, it would be okay. But in Illinois, it's also not acceptable to ask any questions about salary history during the prospective employment process. All right, and if anyone has additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to Ashley or myself. Um, me being based in the DC area, I'm intimately familiar with the DC, Maryland, Virginia laws and those employment updates that we just discussed. And Ashley, of course, being based in Chicago, uh, can, can answer any of the Illinois specific questions, but feel free to, to reach out to both of us and we can tackle those for you. All right, and with that being said, I think that concludes today's presentation. Again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to us either by phone or email. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.